Good morning, church. Glad to see you guys or be with you guys this morning, uh, even if it's just virtually. Looking forward to, since this is early on Sunday morning, hearing your voice here in just a few minutes. Um, let's talk about the Word of God. We have been talking about politics for the last few weeks, but we're not talking about politics in the sense that I'm trying to encourage you to or discourage you from being a Republican or a Democrat or an Independent, any thing like that, but rather we're wanting to um, make good on that commitment we made in our baptism and uh, that commitment we made in um, the act of taking communion that we do every week and ask what does it mean to follow Jesus into the realm of politics. And there are a couple of things that we've been laying on the table. We're still very early in this conversation. It is uh, still kind of in an inter introductory sort of phase. Um, the first thing that we have talked about and we want to remind ourselves of on a fairly frequent basis is that um, American politics, um, U.S. politics, are one expression of politics, but politics is really just a word that talks about how we organize our community. And so when we talk about it in that broader sense, if there are other ways possible of organizing a community, of being together, of being a, of a people or um, a nation, groups of different sizes, uh, we begin to notice a couple of things. Uh, first, Jesus was inescapably political. We talked about that two weeks ago. Um, but, and we began talking about this one last week, Jesus was inescapably political in ways that were vastly different than the people around him. And what that means for us, I think, as we follow him, practically speaking, is that it means that we are going to be inescapably political. Uh, we're going to have a definite um, notion and manner of organizing communities, of how we should live life together as humans. But what we will find is because our world is not terribly different from Jesus' world, uh, is that we will be inescapably political in ways that are vastly different than those around us when we follow Jesus. There will be some overlap, there will be some similarities, there will be some things that that look the same from various angles and various sides of the conversation, but at the end of the day, at its root, that's what that word radical means, remember, at its root, the way Jesus um, comes into the world and says, this is how community works, it's going to be vastly, radically, utterly different than the way people are doing it around us. And so what we do, this is kind of getting into where we're gonna go next, um, what we do is we stand as a witness to the possibility of another way. The way that God is bringing about through Christ in the world, the way that in the final tally things will work as a matter of course. We are a sign, a portent, a pointer to the future and making known the possibility of a new way of doing things. Uh, but to the second point, Jesus is radically different in his politics than everybody around him, and therefore we will be radically different in our politics from everybody around us. Uh, we've broken that down into two parts, and we talked about the first part last week. But I want to kind of review and then get into this week by just reminding you that the way we tell stories um, is important. We all are storytelling creatures. That's what humans do. We, we tell stories. And our stories are the way that we give meaning to things, the way that we explain where we've come from and where we are and where we're going. They are the thing that we use, the mechanism we use to pass down values from generation to generation to explain what is important about us. And this is the way the world works. We tell stories, and so the stories we tell are fundamentally important. And... Uh, of course, these stories can sometimes be big stories. <clears throat> sometimes they can be small stories. Sometimes uh, they are true stories, and that is the goal, to tell stories that kind of touch base with reality. But sometimes we, we tell ourselves false stories as well. But we always live out of those stories. And so the humorous example I've always given, because this part I believe is review, is that if I tell myself the story that one more donut won't hurt, I'm more than likely going to live out of that story and eat one more donut. Uh, back in 2006, Michelle and I uh, 
bought into the story that housing prices always go up and we bought us a reasonable little three bedroom house in Kingston, Tennessee, only for a year later to find out that story wasn't accurate. We were underwater on that house when the housing market crashed. And um, so we live out of our stories. And what we talked about last week, and we tried to demonstrate from scripture, and I asked you to pay attention to the world around you and see if it weren't true in in your life, and I believe it is, is that the world predominantly lives out of a story that goes something like this. We live in a scary place, and by the way, the Bible will not refute that. We live in a scary place because sin has let death loose in the world. And the solution to that scariness is to find out who or what is to blame and then get some power over that person or that person group or that thing. And so we uh, tell the story of fear and accusation and power. And in the story of fear and accusation and power, the way you address problems is to try to outshout or outvote or outspend or out legislate or out bomb or out argue the people that oppose you. We divide the world into groups of us and them. And you don't have to pay attention for very long to see that this is the dominant mode in the politics of the world, not just in America. We have a particular version of that in the United States, but if you go throughout history, you drop yourself at any point on the globe, at any point in history, chances are pretty good, pretty high that you're going to find yourself in the middle of this story of fear and accusation and power played out in small ways and big ways. This was the Egyptian politic. This was the Babylonian politic. This was the Assyrian politic. This was the Israelite politic. This was the Roman politic. This has certainly been the American politic. This is, um, I'm contending, just the way, kind of by default, the world works. This story of fear, and accusation, and power. There's something wrong with the world, and to fix it, we gotta find out who is to blame and get some power over those people right? Um, but Jesus, this is where we want it to come to today. Jesus is going to come into the world and offer a different story. He's going to offer us a different way of looking about the situation, of assessing the situation, of moving forward with the situation. And the story of Jesus in a nutshell is basically the story of the God who comes in human form into the world who acknowledges and who um, accepts the brokenness of the world, that it is a scary place, that there are bad things that happen as something that needs to be dealt with. But rather than taking up the impulses of accusation and power over, he rather takes up the way of the cross. And in taking up the way of the cross, instead of taking power over people, the one who has the most power, he lays his power down and he gives his life for those who could rightfully be blamed. And so we want to talk about this um, from a couple of different directions this morning and then moving forward, kind of having these introductory things on the table, we, we want to start moving more into this politic. But Jesus matches the story of fear and accusation and power with the story of the cross. And the story of the cross subverts so many things in that story of fear and accusation and power. But at the first, you're going to notice that they are primarily concerned with the same things. Both stories, whether you're talking about the world's story of fear and accusation and power, you're talking about Jesus' story of, of the cross, both of them begin with the world being a broken and a scary place. And I think that's something that we need to pay attention to. Because oftentimes we assume, and this is something that runs strong through um, this, this line of thinking that says that Jesus isn't political, that, that church ought to never get into politics. And if by um, telling you that you ought to vote Republican or Democrat or Independent or write your senator or don't write your senator vote or don't vote, if that's what you mean by getting into politics, the church shouldn't get into politics. But uh, what we find is that when Jesus shows up in the flesh as God in flesh, what he demonstrates is God's heart for fixing and addressing the brokenness of the world. That, that is to say that rather than being um, 
disinterested in many of the things that we try to address in our politics. God is actually deeply invested in those things and um, God is working to address those things. And so many of the goals that we have um, when we take up the story of fear and accusation and power and Jesus takes up the story of the cross, many of our goals are the same way. We might look at the world and say, you know, uh, poverty or drug addiction or corruption or um, sexism or racism or whatever issue that we're going to place on the table runs rampant in the world and this has created a world where things that should never happen happen with startling regularity. And so finding that scariness, that brokenness, we take up the story of fear and accusation and power to try to address those things. Uh, when Jesus likewise comes into the world, he begins with the acknowledgement, the deep investment in the notion that things like racism and sexism and corruption and violence and poverty, things like that, the same issues we're concerned with are issues that need to be addressed. His major point is not going to be that, oh, it doesn't really matter. We don't have to be concerned with the poor. We don't have to be concerned with racism or we don't have to be concerned with sexism or corruption or violence. His message is not that those things don't matter. He wasn't some quote unquote spiritual leader over here on the side doing something different that was kind of separate from all of those other concerns as if Jesus is going to be a spiritual leader but we have to come over here and do politics to handle these real world problems but rather what he's going to do is he's going to say if you want to address the evil of racism or the evil of sexism or the evil of corruption or the, the evil of violence or the evil of um, you know poverty he says you're going to have to take a different route because what we find if we look at history is that story of fear and accusation and power as a way of addressing rightful concerns, as a way of addressing legitimate problems in a world controlled by sin and death. He says the story of fear and accusation and power is a story that is not going to work. Um, it didn't work for Pharaoh and it certainly didn't work for the Hebrews that Pharaoh was trying to fix. It didn't work for the Babylonians or the Assyrians or the Persians or the Greeks or the Romans. It has not worked at any point in history. And so in one sense, Jesus comes into the world and he says, I agree with your assessment of a lot of the problems. I agree with a lot of the things that you were concerned with. There were a lot of people in his day concerned with things like poverty. Now their scope might have been different. Um, there were certainly those in power in his day that were concerned with poverty so far as extended to them. They did not want to be in poverty and so that was a problem they sought to address. Whether or not they were concerned with those who were already in poverty might be a different thing. Um, but he says the way we've gone about trying to address this thing is never going to work. It's never going to take you where you want to go. Fear and accusation and power never will take you where you want to go. So let me offer you a different way. Let me offer you a different way. And it's notable that Jesus comes into this scenario. He comes into earth to, to take up this agenda of addressing um, the brokenness of the world. Right? And just, just listen to the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5. This is... This is a description, a beautiful description of what God is doing through the kingdom. Blessed are those who are, are hopeless. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who are meek. Blessed are those who are hungering and thirsting for something other than the world they have experienced. Blessed are those who are, who are persecuted. Those are the kinds of people Jesus came in to address. When he came in to address those people, he came into the situation as one with more power than anybody else ever could have conceived of. Right? And so... <clears throat> What I want you to see is if the story of fear and accusation and power were ever going to work, if it was just a matter of, you know, doing it better than the people who did it before us, you know, they got it wrong, they messed up, they made a misstep, their calculus was wrong, but we're going to get it right. If anybody was ever going to get it right, Jesus was the one to get it right. He um, had perfect knowledge and wisdom. He had perfect judgment. He had infinite power. If anybody was going to get fear and accusation 
and power right. Jesus was the guy. He could have, again, with perfect judgment, snapped his finger using his power to immediately wipe out all of the bad guys who create all of the problems, who are responsible for all of the brokenness. Just snap his finger and they would have been done. And left only the good guys. Wah! The, the world is fixed, you know. Um, now, never mind, there wouldn't have been anybody left but Jesus. It's one of the things about accusation. We point our finger, but we forget that we're part of the problem too. But you notice that Jesus didn't do that. In the Garden of Gethsemane, um, Jesus speaks almost directly to this issue. He says um, to Peter, who had pulled out a sword when the soldiers came into the Garden of Gethsemane and started whacking off people's ears. He said to Peter, put away your sword and he says, um, tellingly, and we should reflect on this more, those who live by the sword will die by the sword. And then he can, you can tell that it's on Jesus' mind. He, he's thinking about it. He knows the possibilities. He understands the power that he has and what that could mean for the situation, the way this thing normally plays out in the world. He says, don't you think that all I would have to do is petition my father and he would send legions of angels to help me in this cause. We sing that song, right? Um, if we were meeting face to face, or at least top half of our faces this morning, we might sing, you know, he could have called 10,000 angels. Jesus says, don't you know that I could do that? I have the power to do that. It's my prerogative to do that. I'm within my rights to do that. It's within the realm of possibility for me to do that. And he could have done it perfectly. He could have done it with such precision that only the wicked were taken out. That, that could have been the way that this went. But that would have been um, yet just another manifestation of the way that we've been doing business since the beginning of time. The way you fix what is broken with the world is take those who you blame and get some power over them. And so Jesus says, rather, what we're going to do here so we're going to lay our power down. I'm going to choose not to play the power over game, but I'm going to lay my power down and go to the cross. Uh, Peter, who uh, was in that crowd whacking off ears, who was told to put his sword away, he would talk about this later. In 1 Peter chapter 2, he's talking to uh, various groups of people in 1 Peter who are persecuted by the broader world in various ways, and most recently at the end of chapter 2, talking to slaves who are undergoing harsh treatment. And he says to uh, all of these people who are being persecuted that Jesus left an example for us. He says that when Jesus was insulted, he did not insult in return, that when Jesus was reviled, he did not seek revenge. Jesus did not take the opportunity to, to take up his considerable power and use it against those who were wrong as a way of fixing the problems in the world, but rather what he did was he went to the cross. He laid his power down, he went to the cross, and it says that he entrusted himself to the one who judges wisely. And this, for Peter, is the path forward. This is the way that we are to do business. Jesus, having all power and refusing to use that power and go to the cross, brings us a different way of doing things. Gives us a different story than the tired, worn, tried, and failing narrative of fear and accusation and power. He says to us as he goes to the cross to lay his power down, take up your cross and follow me if you are going to be my disciple. And so uh, we're going to wrap this up today. I just wanted to kind of get those stories out on the table. But here is the essence of what it means to, to take up our crosses. In a world that is uh, faced with brokenness and fear and scariness of a world ruled by sin and death where those around us take up in the face of that fear accusation and power over we've got to beat the democrats because if they win everything's going to fall apart we've got to beat the republicans because if they win everything's going to fall apart we got to protect ourselves from the people on the other side of that line on the map that we call a border um 
And we could keep going with those sorts of examples, couldn't we? In a world where that's the normal sort of reaction, us and them and we're good and they're bad and we got to take care of them because they're the reason the world's broken. Jesus says, take up your cross. And taking up our cross is most fundamentally, and we'll talk about this in the coming weeks, but most fundamentally, the act of laying our power down, which is a serious consideration because as Americans, we have considerable power invested in us laying our power down and rather adopting in the face of a broken world an ethic of love christ-like love following jesus and so um i want you just to ponder that especially as you go out and if you're on social media you see all the vitriol and the, the hatred and uh, the anger that is going on and it's not that the issues that people are being vitriolic and hateful and angry about are necessarily bad issues Jesus would say yep that's a problem but the way you're going about it, it's never going to get you where to where you want to go um, as you watch the news as you listen to the talk at the grocery store around the water cooler as you feel frustrated because you're trying to protect yourself and your neighbors in this time of pandemic and and you're lonely ask yourself Am I living, are we living out of the story of fear and accusation and power? Or are we living out of the story of the cross? Jesus comes in and he says, I get where you're coming from, but with that accusation and power bit, you're never going to get to where you want to go. Let me show you a different way. Now, we haven't talked a lot about what that means yet, just in a very broad, basic way. But this is the heart of the politics of the New Testament the way of the cross. So let me pray for you, and then I'm going to ask you to pray with me. And uh, then we're going to remember who we are as we go out into God's world. And boy, do we need to remember who we are these days. It's um, constantly tempting to forget. And so here we go. Lord God, we pray that you would give us the wisdom, presence, and the courage to be your people be people of the cross in a world that has taken up a different route. Lord, this will be tense and this will make for uncomfortable situations. We pray that you would pour grace and mercy and light through us and in our interactions with others. And now we come to you as a family and we pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we have forgiven those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one for yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory now and forever. Amen. We shall love the Lord with all our heart with all our soul, with all our mind, and with all our strength. This is the first and greatest commandment, and a second like unto it is this, we shall love our neighbor as ourselves. All of the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. We love because God first loved us, and anyone who says that they love God but hates their brother or sister is a liar. How are you going to love God whom you have never seen if you don't love your brother or sister who is right in front of you? So this is the command we have from him. Those who love God must also love their brother and sister. Church, we love you. We miss you. We are praying for you and rooting for you from way over here. We can't wait to see you again. Have a good week.